What is up everybody, this is DJ Friendzone, and today is what I want to do is show you guys how to make a template that you can use when you're creating a new beat from scratch. And this can be a beat, for instance, that you're making just with virtual instruments, um, if you want to record something, or if you, you have a sample that you want to start with, um, you can also use this template and it just kind of has things set up in a way that, in my opinion, makes a lot of logical sense. And when you're calling up a new project, it's really easy from there to just kind of get all the samples you need and get going. So the, I'm going to use FL Studio 20 for this, and I'm going to use a lot of the new features that are in 20.1, actually, including the instrument tracks, because for me, that's been really helping my workflow because of the way that I work. Um, one thing I should just sort of like, qualify this with is I don't, I'm not arguing this is the best way um, or even the right way, because there's no right way to do this. This is just the way that I've done it. And in my, you know, in all the years I've been doing this, I've found this to be the most helpful. So starting opening up FL, um, the first thing I want to do um, when you when you start FL, if you're loading, loading the default project, this is just new from template and it's just this basic with limiter. And the first thing I'm actually going to do, because it's always a good idea to have a limiter on the master, and there's a good chance I'll change this out for a different limiter later on, but I'll keep this the way it is now. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to select all these and I'm going to alt delete and just get rid of that because I want to start from a brand new um, empty project, so to speak. And there's a way you can do this too by going new from template and there's just completely empty. Um, so the first thing I'm actually going to do is um, get some drum channels in here. And I generally like to start with the drums first, even if, if I'm producing, generally it'll be starting with a sample and then maybe laying the kick and, and the clap and the snare. But for me now, because I don't really have a sample, I'll, I'll make room for that later, but I'll start with sort of creating all the channels for the drums. And just for the sake of sort of keeping things simple, um, I'm gonna be using all samples from this Lex Luger drum kit, um, the original one that you can find. It's a great kit and has a lot of like 808 style sounds, like the Rolling TR-808. So um, usually when I'm producing, I like to, to grab samples from all these different packs because that makes things like interesting. You're not using the same samples from the same pack over and over, and it gives you your own style as a producer. And also when you're loading up this template, you're gonna wanna change out the drum samples anyway because you don't wanna be using the same samples on all your projects, um, depending on what type of, what, what sort of like subgenre you're working on. I mean, if you're doing like, like trap, then there's a good chance you'll be using 808 style samples like hats and, and claps and stuff. So I guess in that case, it's good to start a project where you have those samples loaded up or at least ones you can use as a starting point. So to sort of to sort of get going, I'm first gonna pick a kick and what I'm looking for is something that has a decent amount of bottom end that can hold its own. Um, but really what I'm looking for is that, that main click or the attack part because the 808 or the sub bass is gonna really fill up that low frequency range. That's nice actually. So I'll probably use this one. And what I'm gonna do is instead of actually creating a channel and dragging it on the channel, I'm actually gonna drag it onto one of the playlist tracks. And this is one of the new features in FL20. You can create an instrument track. And the really nice thing about this is it automatically links this playlist track to this mixer track and to this, um, to this channel. So really is what you can now do is now if I rename it, for instance, kick one, um, I recolor it and I put a symbol on it, then it, that change will be reflected in the, um, in the channel rack, in the mixer, and of course in the playlist as well. So any of these things, they're all basically linked. And you can tell that it's an instrument track because of this little eye here. So once that's done, the next thing I'll generally do is move on to sort of a clap and a snare. And I usually like using maybe one or two claps, and then I actually like having more than one snare because I might use one sort of add some low into the clap and then another one sort of fulfills or two fulfills or more. Um, but for now, maybe I'll just pick two and then from there, if we want to add more later on, we totally can. That's nice. So I'm going to drag that one on. Once again, make this instrument track and call this snare one and label it as well. And then generally when I'm also like, when, when I'm looking for these snares, I'm looking for something that's tight and short, kind of like this one is. Uh, this is a little longer, but that's fine. And then I'm looking for something like probably really compressed and distorted that can be used as sort of a nice like fill. 
That one's actually pretty nice. I'll probably choose this one. Call this snare two and give it a color. Uh, the next thing I'll look for is a clap. This is nice. Sounds like there's a little bit of saturation or distortion on it. So I'm going to drag this in. The tracks call this a clap. One. Um, and as you can see, these, these channels are all um, moving over here. And while I'm here, I might actually change the icon and all of these to, to be a, to be a snare drum. Um, there's not really a clap symbol. I wish there was. And the way out that you can do this is double clicking and dragging. So like, you like click on one, but if you double click and drag, you can actually select multiple tracks and then any changes you, you make will actually apply to all of them. And you can use this to also lower multiple faders at the same time too, which is really nice. So moving on, the next thing I'll probably do is add some snares in there, or sorry, um, some hi-hats. So I'll probably go over here and that's nice. So I'll put this on here, make this an instrument track and go ahead and this is a closed hat. So I'm gonna call it CH1. Um, and I'll give it an icon that looks like a symbol. Um, I generally think it's a good idea to have multiple closed hats, so I'll look for another one. And a lot of times you can use the same one and just pitch it down or something. Or you can, of course, pitch it in the piano roll. But I like having two different sounds that I can then pan differently and, and do different processing on, because I think that can make things... It, it could just add, add something a little bit more interesting to your, to your song. So that's kind of a high one. So I might, I actually like that. I call this closed hat two. And I'm gonna give this a color. And then the last thing I'm gonna look for for high hats is actually an open hat. And I actually like the 808 open hats. And there's one in particular in this pack that I use a lot. And you can put all sorts of reverb on it and it sounds really nice to me. It's this one. So I'm going to create an instrument track and I'm going to call this OH1 for open hat. Uh, give it a color, give it a name, and I'm also going to give it a open hat symbol so that these are all lined up. And then sort of the next thing I'll probably add is a crash symbol. And Like that one, so I'm gonna actually drag this here. But I'm gonna make this an audio track, and the reason I want to do that is now this 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 sample itself can be I can see where the sample is for some of these longer transitions. So for me, that's just pretty helpful. Um, just having that here, that way I can just kind of see where this is coming in, and it's a little bit easier since I'm not really gonna be doing all sorts of crazy patterns or rolls with this. It makes a little bit more sense to see the sample here, and I'm gonna just rename this. Um, this channel, Crash 1. Notice this symbol just means it's a sample track. Um, of course, you can change it, but I'm just gonna have it like that. So this isn't actually an instrument track like these other guys, it's actually what's called an audio track. So any audio that I place on this track will be routed through this mixer channel, which is really nice. That's kind of what you'd expect to see in a traditional digital audio workstation like Logic or, or Cubase or Studio One. So um, kind of nice that they added that in. Um, the next thing maybe I'll add is like a snap. I don't always use a snap, but to me, it's kind of nice to have it sometimes. That's nice. Call that instrument track, and this is just going to be snap one. Give it a color, and it's not really a good symbol for this, so I kind of use this these symbols for sort of miscellaneous percussion, which is um, probably what I'll do here. And I might move this up to be with the snares and claps, and the way that you do that, is you hold down shift and you use the up and down arrow, or the, sorry, the mouse wheel, and you can move it wherever you would like to have it. So now that's in place. Um, and here's usually a good, a good spot to like add a place for any auxiliary percussion. So things like, um, I don't know, the bongos and, and shakers and anything, any other sorts of things you wanna add. So usually what I do to do this is 
I create an instrument track with the FPC plugin on it. And let me see if I can find it. Here it is. And what I do then is I actually want to clear this so that there's no samples on it. So I'm going to choose empty. And I'm just going to rename this guy with percussion. Um, it's going to have its own color. And I'm just going to give it this sort of the drum pad symbol because what I can do then is if I want to put any other sort of percussion that I may not mix as sort of particularly as some of these other things, I can just drag into these pads and then map these pads to the pads I have on my keyboard, um, like the machine or something like that. So that's kind of what I'm going to do there, but I'm actually not going to touch that too much right now. Um, so once we have this done, this is sort of all of our, our um, percussion that I might start with. And of course I can add more later, but um, I'll just probably start with this. And then next thing I'll probably make room for is um, actually like the main sample or loop that I'm going to be using itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, and the reason I like making this an instrument track is because I like having the ability to sort of chop it up in an interesting way. So I'm actually going to make this into an instrument track with SliceX on it. So um, let's see if I can find it here with SliceX. And what I'm just going to call this is just main sample. Once again, I may not choose to use this at all, but I like having the option to do that. And really the benefit of doing this is let's say you find a sample. So let's say I just find some melodic loop. So that's nice. I can drag this in here. And that's what I can do is, and I don't always do it this way, but um, that's a lot of different regions. But so you'd obviously have to go here later and edit it, but you cannot play this across the keyboard. Really nice for chopping things up. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there. Um, and I'm not going to use this pattern at all. In fact, I'm probably going to delete it. Right click and just delete it. In fact, I'm going to do that for all of these because um, if I need a pattern, I'll just make it from scratch, aside from this guy, because this is just, this is an audio track. This isn't like an actual pattern. So I'll keep that there. Now, the next thing that I will create is the 808, and that's going to be sort of there with the kick. And I actually usually, when I'm making these, I have sort of like two 808s. I have an 808 sample and then a synthesized 808 that's a preset that I use in Massive. And I like having both of these because sometimes I like being able to use a sample and tune it to the key of the song. And sometimes I like being able to use a synthesized version. Um, that way I can adjust the sound. So to sort of get the, um, to get the, the, the sample 808, what I'm going to do is just go into this into this Lex Luger kit once again. And I, I actually prefer getting my 808 somewhere else, but for now, since I'm using everything from here, I'm just going to look for a sample here that matches. That's pretty nice. So drag that in click here and make this instrument track and I'm going to name this 808 um, S for sample. Um, you can call it whatever you want. Actually, maybe I'll just call this 808 one um, because if I call it sample, then that's going to be confusing because S could also be synthesized and there it is. So now the, by making a sampler channel out of this, I'm actually played across the keyboard. And one of the things I also like doing with this is using this cut self button. Um, what this does is basically whenever it re-triggers the notes, it stops the previous sound from playing. So with your bass frequencies, the, the frequency is so low that the wavelength ends up being really big. And if these things are overlapping, you can get your bass just kind of dropping out. So doing this ensures that it keeps it from getting really muddy. So you can actually hear the difference. So it's actually cutting the note before. And I'm just going to keep that here. Once I, when I start making a song and I decide on an actual 808 that I like, what I usually do is I go in here, open it in the audio editor and do this thing that detects the pitch regions. So there is this edit, detect pitch regions. And this tells me that it starts at G and it goes down to F sharp. 
And the reason I like doing this is then I can set the root note of this to be either G or F sharp. And now if I play a C, that's actually playing a C on the 808. It's not, you're not having to do these weird transpositions. So that way, if let's say you're using a sample that's in G sharp, you can just play a G sharp and you don't have to worry about, oh, my 808 that I imported was in, you know, this had this note, but it's actually playing a different note because the sample's like offset to a different note. So basically the way it works in FL Studio is in the sampler, um, it's gonna, it maps to middle C or C5, the actual like regular, um, unstretched, untimed version of the sample, and then it'll pitch it down or up based on how you play the keyboard. So it's important to actually set the, the note of your 808 to this point on the keyboard. Otherwise, you can end up sort of with, with an issue when you're trying to play like a, a pattern or a certain melody or you want, let's say, a certain note or a certain frequency. So I'm just going to keep that there. And once again, there's a good chance this will change in later on when I decide to use a different 808 whenever I'm making a song. But for now, it's just a good idea. Um, to do. So the next thing I'm going to do is add a synthesized 808 that I can use in addition to the sampled one. And I would never use them both at the same time, but really based on the project, if I want to have a lot of tonal control, then I'll use the synthesized version. Um, otherwise, if I find a sample that I like or I, I you know, resample bass that I've already used before, I might use a sample. So I just like having the flexibility. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one of these channels and moving it up, I'm just going to hold down shift and use the mouse wheel again. And when I'm here, I'm going to right click track mode. And I'm actually going to not assign this right now because I'm actually going to drag a saved patch that I, um, that I'm going to choose to use as an 808 for now. And once again, this may change as well, but I'm just going to drag this on here and it's going to make a mixer channel for me. And uh, of course, a channel in the playlist as well. And this is just a synthesized 808 in uh, Native Instruments Massive. So it sounds pretty good. I mean, nothing too special on it now. Um, most of the character that I, I use when I actually end up using this sound, I'm going to change the symbol to be bass symbol, actually comes from some of the processing I'm, I'm doing on the mixer channel. So I haven't really played around with the mixer too much now, but since I'm adding this instrument in, I do have an associated mixer channel that I usually use when I'm using the sound. So um, what this is, is just, it's very simple. It's a uh, EQ that's a uh, high pass about 26 Hertz. And this doesn't have to always be here. I just like taking out these lows that you're never going to hear anyway, that are eating up the headroom in your mix. But the big thing is this supercharger plugin from Native Instruments. It was a free compressor. I don't know if it's free anymore, but it was free at a certain point. And the real trick here is to turn on this dirt button. So if you hear it with the supercharger and without, notice how it's about the same level, but really adds a number of um, extra upper harmonics. So, so it really brings the sound through. So if you're listening to it on, you know, computer headphones or laptop speakers or something that's, you know, kind of or through your phone, um, this will really help the, the bass kind of cut through in the uh, upper mid area where in you're not playing it on a system that would be able to reproduce it. I'm actually gonna keep this punch off, even though it adds quite a bit to the sound. Um, I want the kick to actually be doing most of the work in terms of, of providing the punch, and I want this to really focus on providing the sort of the sustained like tonal bass, what, what people really think of when they think of like a sub bass or, or an 808. Um, so with that, there's only one more thing that I wanna do, and that's to add, um, well, actually a few more things. I want to add a lead, a piano, and then some vocal effects. So for the leads, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to find, and this doesn't have to be super particular, but I'm just going to right click here and I'm going to create a new instrument track with um, Leonard Digital Silent. And there's just a ton of great leads to choose from on here. So I'm just creating this to kind of be a placeholder in case I want to add a lead and play something on the keyboard. So I'm just going to call this lead one give it a color, give it a symbol, and this one I'm probably going to give it, usually I, I kind of give these these leads different sort of patterns, but I'm probably just going to put this piano looking like on, and we're just going to leave that like that for now, because once again, based on the lead, a lot of the processing is going to change. Um, that is what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a piano, 
So once again, I'm gonna go change this to track mode, um, instrument track, and I'm gonna go to FL keys. And most of the time I actually, sorry, most of the time I actually get my pianos from Nexus, but if I really am trying to, to, to start a new project, uh, Nexus can take a while to load. And if I'm using the laptop without my Nexus dongle, it, it won't load and that gets really annoying. So I like just kind of having a keyboard I can, I can, that can load up the project really quick. And then if I want to change the sound or I'm actually using it, I'll pick a different one. So I'm going to pick FL keys. That's going to show up here. I'm going to rename it and give it a color. Piano one, there's not very often I use more than one piano, but you never know. I'm going to kind of give this an orange color. And of course, um, make this over to piano. And now that's there. So very dry, very basic sort of piano, and that'll be something I will likely play around with later or in the mix. And then the next thing I'm going to do um, is add a spot for some vocal effects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into an instrument track, um, make this a sampler. Let me find where that thing is. Here it is. And I'm going to right click and call this vocal effects one. And usually I make my effects channels to be green um, or greenish sort of blue and give it sort of a vocally looking icon. That way I know that it's a vocal track. And um, that's going to be here. And then at this point, if I want to add more vocal effects, then I can add them here. So this is stuff like, you know, DJ Mustard's like Haze, samples like that. Um, usually add those in. One more thing now, I'm just going to delete this sampler channel because I'm not using it. And this was just put here by default when the project was created. So that's going to be deleted. And the last thing I'm going to do here in the playlist is I'm actually going to go here and I'm going to go to these patterns and I'm going to select unused, which I guess a lot of these, or sorry, a lot of these are used because they're apparent here, even though there's nothing in them. So I'm going to right click to delete these guys. Now is what I'm going to do, select unused and I'm going to delete them. So now that they're deleted, I just have one, um, now I'm starting with a pattern. So when I'm actually starting a song, I don't have all these weird clips around. Even though chances are, you know, when I start building this up, you know, I will sort of create these patterns. It's just right now I don't want to have anything. I want to be starting from scratch because the thing I've tried having some preset patterns built in and more often than not, those annoy me and I end up just starting ignoring the template altogether because it has like content there that I don't want it to have. Um, one thing that's bothering me is this should just be called like sample. So this is my like main sample. And then this is all organized from here. The dog outside. Okay, so now with that is what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move on to the mixer. It's probably good boy, thank you. Anyway. So at this point is what I'm going to do is start doing some very, very, very basic sort of processing on the mixer channels, some basic routing, then I'm going to set up sends and returns. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to reorganize these 808s to be next to the kick because these, in the way that I produce my track, I have these bouncing off of each other a lot. So the way I'm going to do this is hold down shift and then use the mouse wheel to move them over here. The next thing I'm going to do is I want to create a bus for sort of all the bass instruments. That way all these low frequencies can be processed together and I can control them all at once. And the reason I wanna do this is um, but I like getting a, a balance between the, the 808 and the kick. And then kind of once I get those two mixed together in a way that I like it, um, I can just use one knob and not have to adjust the two knobs individually. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna click over here and Actually, I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to create a bus for these 808s. And the reason I want to do this is that way, if I am using multiple 808s, I can control their levels together. So the easiest way to do this is select these different channels. And I'm going to make sure these volumes are all, you know, starting up here. I'm going to right click and click route to this track only. So no longer is this sending audio out to the master channel. It's actually sending audio directly to this channel. So if I play a note here, and if I find the channel, Notice how audio is coming out of this track, going through this bus track, this is gonna be a bus track, and then it's going to the master. So now I'm just gonna call this 808 bus, and I'm gonna give it an icon that lets me know that it is summing the, I guess, a few channels before it. 
Now so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this channel be the sort of bass bus. And by bass is what I mean is just all the low frequency stuff, um, including kicks. And then if I'm using like a low synth or something like that, um, I'll also have that there. I'm gonna give this an icon. And the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna route this 808 bus to the bass bus. And I'm also gonna route the kick to this bass bus. So this is really gonna be sort of the the kick and, and bass bus, or kick and 808 bus. So we rename it that way. And one thing I sometimes like to do is there are these separators you can add here um, in between sort of these different groups of channels, um, which I may actually kind of do here and here, just so I know everything else that's going on. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a percussion bus for all of this, all of these drums. So I'm going to select all of these rather than having to do these individually. Right click here and click route to this track only. So now if I click on any one of these, notice how they're all routed to this track. And then this track, and like all tracks, is by default routed to the master. And I'm going to call this um, drum bus. So this is going to be all the percussion and drums that um, has nothing to do with the kick and the 808. So all the other stuff. So uh, open hats, closed hats, things like that. Um, I want those all to be going to this bus and got that. And so now I'm going getting into some processing here. So generally is what I like to do on every single one of these channels is have a high pass filter. And the reason is these, these low frequencies can end up getting very muddy. And this is something I end up having on a lot of my channels anyway that aren't the kick and the sub. So anything below about 100 hertz is generally where I start with and I can kind of move it from there. Now, sometimes I go up higher for hi-hats and things like that. I might even go up to 500, but I've noticed that for snares, there's generally a peak around 150 to 200 hertz that you don't want to get rid of. So I'm just going to leave it at about, you know, 120, 130, and I'm going to keep it this way. So now I'm also going to apply this to the bus. And the reason I don't just apply it to the bus is applying this filter multiple times is good because it really makes sure there's no low end that's coming through. So it is possible that there is some low end that comes through here if it's only on one channel. So I like also putting a high pass on the bus. So I'm gonna, so to do this, I um, click save preset is, and I'm gonna drag it over to the drum bus and I'm gonna do the same um, to all these other channels. So click on this, file, save preset as, and go to this random percussion bus and kind of go from there. And then this is the kind of thing, I'll probably leave this alone for now until I actually put my samples in. And then from there, it'll just be as simple as just dragging it up to the point that I, I want it to be. So whoops. File, say preset as, just kind of dragging this over. Pretty simple, um, just creating a lot of these instances here. snare and I think that should be all of them. Yep. So now these all have their own EQ on them. And I'm also going to put an EQ on the sample bus. And I'm also going to put one of these EQs on the kick and bass bus, except I'm going to bring this way down to about 25 hertz. Just that way we're cutting out any of the lows that could be possibly coming through, but we can't really hear. And I'm just going to leave that alone the way that is. And generally, it's a good idea to have this once again on all of your channels because you really don't want these 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 low frequencies coming through on any channels unless it's having bass sounds. The higher frequencies, it's okay because um, the wavelength is so short that you end up. It's okay if there's some phase cancellations, but for bass uh, frequencies, you can actually get entire cancellation down the low frequencies, and it can get really muddy and eat up a lot of your headroom. So now that that's set up. The next thing I want to do is set up some sends and returns. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to scroll over to these last um, four or five channels. I'm going to select them. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to dock to the right. So now you can see they're kind of over here. And if I click this separator, it'll move it back and forth. And the reason I like doing this is I can put plugins or effects on these tracks that I'll likely use for multiple channels. And it saves a lot of CPU usage being on these channels as opposed to using the same copy of everything on these guys. 
So this includes things like reverb and, and delay, things that I'm going to be using a lot. So this first one, I'm going to make this, I'm going to call this reverb and it's going to be ambience. So ambience are really, really short, small reverbs that just give a little bit of space into your mix. And I'm going to have one channel that's going to be like this. And I'm just going to give it this reverb symbol. Boom, there it is. This next one is going to be a reverb and it's going to be a medium sized reverb. So something with a decently long tail, maybe two to five seconds and um, can control that. So this ambience is going to be definitely less than one second. This is going to be sort of like a medium length reverb. And this guy is going to be here. It's going to be a reverb and it's going to be a big one. And this is often used for those big effects, um, any sort of sweeps and transitions or something where you want a really big tail on it. So I'm going to add one of those as well. And then this guy is what I'm going to do. This is going to be a delay. And I'm, that's all I'm going to put on here because I generally, based on what the tempo of the song is and what the rhythm is, um, that's going to change basically what sort of delay I'm using, what timing it is. It has a halftime fill. So um, all those things, I'm actually going to kind of leave this alone a little bit and just use kind of a simple, I don't know, I guess like a little just kind of keep this there there for the future. And one thing that's 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 good bef um, before I actually add these reverbs, I'm actually going to add this high pass filter again, and I'm going to bring this down a little bit, just that way none of the low reverb frequencies get in. And this is something that's going to be copied to all of these channels. So once again, we're, I'm probably not going to be wanting to put any reverb on the 808s. Sometimes the kick drum can benefit from a little bit of ambience, but I don't always do that. So now that's set up. So the last thing I'm going to do is actually add in the reverb that I'm going to use on these channels. So for this ambience reverb, there's this wonderful free plugin you can get called Ambience. And I'm just going to load it up. And the one on Windows actually has a number of great presets. The one on Mac, um, there are probably presets somewhere, but I don't know where to find it. But I'm just going to keep this here and I'm going to probably keep a lot of the default settings. And to give you an idea of what this sounds like, I'm actually going to send one of the tracks here as I'm previewing it. And I'll send this, this clap over. So right now there's no reverb going on with the clap. Now when you're setting up these sends, one thing that's important to do, make sure your dry is all the way down and your wet is all the way up. Because the idea behind these send tracks is I'll be sending the signal from one of these channels to this channel. But this channel is also already, the audio from it is already mapped to the bus. So what's going on here is if, I'm, if I send any of the, the dry signal through this bus channel, the original sound is going to get louder as I, as I like send it over. And then that's going to be really inefficient because not only is there like audio that isn't being processed by the, the channel that I have on the, the, the bus, but I'm not, I can't just use this knob to control just the effect amount, which is what I want it to do. So here's what I have. And the way I'm going to do this, um, I'm going to click here and I'm going to turn this down and then I'm going to slowly turn it up and audition the sound. So this is with it off. This is with a little bit of reverb or ambience. So it's nice. It kind of gives it a little bit of space. It's very subtle. And, and I think the point is, is to keep it pretty subtle and then just kind of adjusting these things to, to get a sound that you really like. So that's nice. It kind of, it's like a little bit of delay and that just keeps things from getting muddy. So I like to use this on a lot of different drums and things like that. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to move this F, uh, this equalization after the, the reverb plugin. That way, if it's adding any sort of echoes, especially in the lower range, I want to cut those out after as opposed to, to beforehand. So now onto this medium reverb, the reverb that I'm going to use for this. Um, sometimes I use the fruity reverb, but one of the ones I've been using a lot recently is this Valhalla Vintage Verb. Here it is. And once again, the mix needs to be on 100%. And I might just choose sort of like a nice little room, choose now, turn up the highs a little bit, turn down the bass a little bit, and the timing, probably keep it around three seconds. And this low cut knob here is really handy, so that way I can kind of, maybe I don't even need the EQ because this is going to EQ some of the low end out anyway. So to hear what this sounds like, I'm actually, for the, for the time being, I'm going to disconnect this clap from the ambience and just turn it to this medium reverb. So notice you can hear it kind of gives it a pretty big tail. 
So I likely wouldn't use that on a clap or drums, but maybe certain instruments, certain leads, things like that. Um, the piano, this would probably work pretty well on. So I'm going to put this back here on the Ambies channel. And finally, for this big reverb, um, I like using this plugin called Arts Acoustic Reverb. And this is really great for those big sort of reverb tails. And the settings here, I'm probably going to pick something really large, like around 8 seconds. I'm going to turn the dry level down, which it already is. Turn this low cut up a little bit to maybe about 300. And then from here, it's just kind of a matter of taste. So I generally like making this a very sort of like a very wide reverb. So it has a lot of stereo image because if this tail is going to be going on a long time, you really want it to fill out a lot of space. Um, might add a little bit of pre-delay, which is just kind of keeps the sound from hitting super hard, right? So you don't want to wash over the initial transient of the sound. That's why I'm adding a little bit of pre-delay and I might maybe make the room size a little bit. A little bit bigger, like 50. Okay, and then to hear what this sounds like, I'm going to take this clap and I'm going to route it to this big reverb. So I'm going to keep that there, and obviously this is a really over like this is really over the top, and that's the nice thing is you can have sort of control over it. But the really nice thing about using sends is I can have different amounts of this reverb applied to different channels. So let's say I move my hi-hat, for instance. Let's say I want to add a little bit of ambience. Um, notice how my clap has, you know, a decent amount of ambience. So, I mean, it's not like a lot, but there's a good chance I'll want less on my closed hat. So this would be the amount that was on the clap. If I want to add a little bit less. See, we don't want to wash over the transient of that sound too much, but we may want to make it sound like it's in sort of the same room as all the other sounds which is really nice. So that's what this allows us to do. So notice how I have a different amount of the clap signal going to this ambience as the closed hat. So that's probably the way I'm gonna keep it. And this open hat, I generally like um, giving this a little bit of, of medium reverb. So I'm gonna send this to the medium verb and slowly turn it up. This might actually be a little bit too long. I might turn this down a little bit. Uh, so another nice thing about sends is you can use it on both. So I have an initial sort of ambience that I'm putting the hat in, and then sort of a medium reverb that pushes it back in the mix a little bit. Well, um, probably the next thing I'm going to do is take a look at the snap. Very dry, so definitely needs some reverb. So likely I'm going to put some ambience on it. Makes a lot of difference. And let's see if any of this medium reverb will sound good. I actually like the way that that sounds. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to, but um, I'm probably gonna keep it like that for now. Once again, based on the samples you choose, um, you might have to go back later and adjust this, but I like having it all set up in this way. Last thing I'm gonna do is take a look at this crash symbol because I always like putting reverb on these crash symbols to sort of wash out the effect and also keep them a little bit back in the mix. So this is what this sounds like now. So I'm gonna give it a little bit of medium reverb and maybe a little bit of this big reverb. That sounds nice. I like the way that that sounds. And maybe at some point I would add a little bit of delay to this. So the thing I'm going to do right now is just add a delay plugin to this delay channel. I'm going to use Fruity Delay 2. And I generally like having a ping pong delay, but of course you can set it to whatever you want. So what ping pong delay does is when the sound comes in, it'll pan it to the left and right and it'll kind of bounce back and forth. But the important thing you have to do is you have to initially pan the sound to one side. That way when it goes through the delay again, it actually pans to the other side once it sort of hits the one side. So what this is going to sound like, and let me go ahead and select this and add a little bit of delay. So I might keep it like that for now, although once again, there's a good chance later on I'll change what this time is. So right now this three is, um, is kind of the, the delay like time. So this, um, I believe, is, is corresponding to dotted eighth notes. So you can hear it sort of dun, 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 like the way it bounces down. So I'm just going to keep it like that for now. And then chances are later on, I will change this around as I know what the tempo of the song is. So I do a lot of stuff about 100 BPM, you know, like if that's sort of the torque 
area and the, and the sort of ratchet area sound, then, you know, I might have to turn this delay up because I may want it to be bouncing around a little bit faster. But luckily we have that control. So the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go here on the master channel and I'm gonna get rid of this Edison because this is what happened when I was analyzing the key of the 808 that I was using. Just delete this. And the thing I like doing for my master channel is the first thing I like having is a, is the Fab Filter Pro Q. And the reason I like using this plugin is it allows me to sort of really be very particular about where I'm cutting the lows and the highs. So the human, the lowest range of human hearing is about 20 hertz. And I generally like cutting a little bit above that because those are gonna be frequencies that most systems aren't gonna be able to reproduce, but it's gonna eat up a lot of your headroom anyway. So I'm gonna change the slope to 24 decibels per octave, which to me is a very musical sounding slope without really messing with the sound. Some people really like going super hardcore um, because theoretically it cuts a lot quicker, but the problem is by doing that, you're gonna be adding a lot of phase changes into your audio, which could create some artifacts um, that you wouldn't want. So I find that 24 is good enough to cut it pretty quickly, but doesn't kind of overdo it. And I'm also gonna add a high cut at 24 dB per octave. And this high cut's gonna be way above the upper end of human hearing. And the reason I wanna do this is if my song is getting bounced down to 44.1 kilohertz or some other sample rate, um, I don't wanna have aliasing. So I don't want the higher frequencies to be showing up hearing, you know, back down here and creating some weird effects. So um, you don't always have to do this. I don't always do this, but I think most of the time it's a good idea. So I'm gonna put this probably at about eh, maybe 22 and a half kilohertz. And that's just gonna be up here. So notice how, the, so it's gonna start cutting the frequency a little bit before this, cause that's just kind of how this works. This is actually really where the half of the power of the sound is. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind. You don't wanna just say, oh, the upper end is 20. Um, so I'm just gonna put that there, but you're already cutting it probably by three dB at 20. So you definitely don't wanna be doing that. So I would say 22 and a half is good starts kind of rolling off at, at this end, and then eventually by the time it gets over there, it's, it's cutting a little bit. In fact, I might increase this maybe to 2,500. So you can see at about 18, 20, it's starting to cut down a little bit. So we don't really need any information that's up in this range, but all of this stuff, especially up to 18K, is really important to have. So I'm just gonna leave that the way it is. Now, it's always a good idea to have a limiter on your master, and that's because you wanna catch any peaks that could possibly come through. So this should always be the last thing in your signal chain. Now the limiter that I like using is the FabFilter Pro L2. And I'm gonna select it. I'm actually not gonna use the, the AU version, I'm gonna use the VST version. The reason for this is, is since I'm on a Mac, if I wanna open this project on Windows, I can't use the VST version. I, I mean, sorry, I can't use the AU because audio units, it's Mac software, it's, it's owned by Apple, that wouldn't work on Windows. So using the VST version means I can open this template on Windows and also work on it on a Windows computer. And the, the starting point I like doing for this is going into basic and transparent. So we don't want this limiter really doing anything too tonal to the sound. And I'm gonna keep the gain at zero, so I'm not trying to really push this hard into the limiter. This is just to try to catch any sort of spurious peaks that could be coming in. Generally when I'm done and I'm ready to, to master the song, I'll turn this over sampling up just so that way it's able to sort of do its best and, and get the best possible sound. But when you're producing, you don't want to be using up your CPU doing processing that doesn't really matter. And the important thing is having this true peak limiting on. If this was on another channel, if this wasn't on the master, you could turn this off and it would let some things through, but we really want to make sure we're squashing all the peaks because any peaks that go above zero dB um, out of here, they're going to get clipped off and it's going to be distorted um, in a way that you probably don't want. So sometimes distortion can sound really nice, but you only want it to be there when you want it there. The last thing I'm gonna add is this free plugin called Span. And it's free VST you can find from this website called Voxango or Voxango. And it's just a spectrum analyzer. And this allows you to kind of check your mix and balance it. So I'm gonna set the mode high resolution. And if I play a sound, you can see, you can kind of see where its frequency content is. So that was a, a crash, so it has a lot of high frequency information. If I go over to sort of my 808, You can see where your notes are hitting and you can see how loud they are with reference to everything else. So once again, when you're mixing a song, um, you obviously wanna mix with your ears and not your eyes, but I found that having a pretty straight line along here is good 
good to have for a balanced mix. Sometimes for more club type songs, it's okay to have a little dip in the, in the middle and you, you have the highs boosted a little and then obviously your lows to, to be reproduced on those big subwoofer systems. But um, I just use this kind of as a guide. And one of the nice things is if I have a reference track, I can use this to kind of check the reference track level and then see if I'm kind of getting the same balance as a reference track that I'm using. And actually, would probably now would be a good time to set up a reference track. So I'm gonna take this channel, move it up to the top, rename it reference. I'm probably not gonna give it a color. And I'm gonna turn this into an audio track. Make this on insert 20. So now this is mapped. And this is just gonna be my reference track. And I'm just gonna have it, whoops, out of here. Make sure it, yeah, just have it over here. So this should be my, something's wrong here. That's definitely routed. So I must have dragged the wrong one over. Track mode, so this is an audio track. Oh, map to insert one. So this is the track, it's just not showing up. So I'm just gonna call this reference. And I'm just gonna keep it like that. And that nice thing is now if I drag a reference track on here, I can turn the volume down so I have it kind of at the same level as my unmastered beat that I'm making. And then just really see, am I getting the right levels? Am I getting the right balance, the right mix um, with my reference track? I don't usually use reference tracks, but sometimes I do. And that's why it's nice to be able to have it already set up in your mix uh, to be able to use. And then one thing I will add is an EQ. And the reason I wanna do this is I wanna be able to, let's say I like the high end or the low end, I like being able to sort of sweep around. So if I wanna just hear, how does my low end match up to the reference track? Well, then is what I can do is use this, this low pass filter. Uh, steep four is the same as 24 per octave. So you see I use that filter slope a lot. And I can just cut this down and listen to just the bass of my reference track. Or I can go and just listen to the highs of my reference track. So um, nice having that flexibility as well. So I'm just gonna keep that the way it is there. And with that, that's pretty much what my template's gonna look like. Um, the last thing I may actually end up doing is sort of doing a playlist bus of all these tracks. So when we can do this is clicking and dragging up on all of these. And now is what I can do is just, just call this, you know, percussion. And I can collapse it if I am happy with the way the percussion is and reopen it back up. So that's pretty much all there is to creating this template. And now when you're ready to start a song, you can load up this template. And if you have your sample or you want to record it in, you can go ahead and do that into this sample category. Play some notes, start adding your drums, start adding the rest of your effects. And then when you want to add more channels and things, you can go ahead and do that too. And, you know, of course you would, if you added more drums, you'd want to add them to the drum bus, things like that. I also left one more insert track that I can use for an extra effect if I want to have another send, or most likely is what I'll do is put a distortion on this channel. That way I can send, use like this as a send to the distortion if I want to use it, but I don't always use it, which is why I don't have anything on it now. One more thing before I, I guess, sign off is I'm going to put my kind of a basic mastering chain here on the master. And the thing I like using is Ozone 8 as my mastering suite. Um, really great plugin, really can't recommend it enough. And I like just having this there, that way eventually I can preview what my song will sound like when, before I'm done really like mixing it, before I've done really done anything to set it up. And I usually have a, I have my own presets, but they're for Ozone 7 and I have it um, merge them over. So my, my normal mastering chain, it's gonna go through this equalizer, which I'm not gonna do anything on right now. This dynamics, I actually prefer using this vintage compressor instead. But before the vintage compressor, I also like using this sort of um, like a vintage EQ or dynamic EQ. So this dynamic EQ is basically sort of like a multiband compressor, but it can adjust these different levels. So the equalizer actually lets me cut and boost, and then this sort of makes sure everything's balanced goes through this vintage compressor, which is sort of like a glue compressor. Um, then is what I'm gonna do is have it go through this, um, this imager. And the thing I like doing with the imager is summing a lot of the low frequencies to mono, and then sort of widening the high frequencies a little bit 
um, in the stereo field. That way you get more separation in the, in the upper end when it actually matters. I'm going to turn the stereo eyes on. That way it's actually really enhancing and creating some extra stereo effect. But once again, that's just something you have to listen to and see if you like it. Then it's going to go through this maximizer, which is really um, just kind of really a multiband compressor. And this might be something I might change later on. Make sure true peak is off because we don't want to be peak limiting multiple times. We want to peak limit once at the end, and that's what this FabFilter Pro L is going to do. And the last thing here I'm going to do is I'm going to add another, this vintage limiter. And all this is going to do, notice how true peak limiting is off. I'm going to bring this up to minus one, and I'm just going to keep this here. And what this is going to be is this will allow me to do a little bit of limiting, maybe with a more, with a different sound. And that relieves some of the stress on this limiter from doing all the work, especially because this is going to be doing peak limiting. So what this guy may be doing is it might be just kind of leveling out the sound and creating being more of a character change than anything else. Whereas this guy's really just trying to be as transparent as possible and help me get the track to be as loud as I want it to be without sort of overdoing it. Now, if you notice my CPU meter here is at 30%, and that's without any instruments or anything running. And one of the things I like doing is just disabling this mastering chain. Notice how my CPU meter drops like 20%. And I'll just turn this on if I want to hear what the reference track would look like. Or let's say um, I'm making a beat for a friend of mine and he really likes the way it's coming along. And it's at a point where he can start writing to it. So he just wants kind of the loop and the idea. So I'll, I'll start making the beat, maybe turn this on, render it down to him, turn it off and do a little bit more work. And then once we get we start getting the arrangement down, that way I'm mixing with low CPU and I'm actually mixing not on the master track. So yeah, that's really all there is to it. This is sort of my, my simple starting template. And likely what I'll do is I'll make another video showing you how to actually make a beat with this template and how easy it is once you really set everything up um, in this sort of way. And you'll see just how quick and how quick it makes your workflow. And the idea is you don't wanna be a template producer. You don't wanna be just loading up this template and using the same sounds over and over. But the idea is saving yourself time, you know, doing all this routing that you're gonna do anyway. Um, you know, setting up these sends and returns and doing all the coloring and naming and things. Those are things you're gonna to have to do every time. And you saw here it took a while. Um, that could be the time, you know, you could make an entire beat in that amount of time that it takes to just rewire all this stuff. So huge fan of using these templates to sort of really speed up your workflow. Now when you're ready to save this, you wanna save it as a template and you're gonna to wanna to go into your project templates, wherever your projects are in FL, and just save it in that folder. And the reason you wanna do this is because when you go new and you go new from template, yeah, here it is. So I'm just gonna load the project anyway. I'm not really using anything that should be special to FL 20.1 point beta, whatever. Okay, so cool, so this, is, this has loaded up. So now if I quit this, because I loaded this from a template, and I reopen FL Studio, it's gonna open up that same template that I started with without any changes to it. And if I try to save it, it's rather than trying to save over it, it'll ask me to save a new project, just like when you're starting from scratch. So if I go, you know, file save as, it'll let me save this project as a new project and it's you know going in the default folder where I would save all of these beats and everything. So that's just sort of a very quick overview on how to create a template how to create a template that you can use to make your beats. Um, really nice starting point, really quick, and hope you all learned a lot. Definitely leave a comment if you have any questions or comments or there's something in particular about the process that you want to know. Um, yeah, and I'll be happy to answer them. All right, peace out. Have a good one.